the Janelle Center on the ASU campus today because tomorrow, a part of our convocation, Michael Snyder and Brandy Phillips will be giving a very mini recital, not near long enough for me tomorrow, Michael. And I've wanted so much to interview you for our television station and our website because people in this city in my less than two years have made it abundantly clear to me how proud they are of you. They feel like you're theirs. So you're not, a village, they feel like, has helped to raise you. And we're going to, uh, I would like to ask you some questions and then get you to play for us today. Great. And uh, Michael has come from Austin. He has told me that he moved here from Georgetown in elementary and went to Goliad and then Lincoln and then graduated from Lakeview in 1993. That's right. And then went to University of North Texas, got his master's in 99, and then, uh, no, got your bachelor's in 99, and then your master's at the Cleveland Institute of Music in 03, and now is at the very best <laughs> university, the University of Texas at Austin getting your PhD and oh how proud we are of you. Thank you. Now go back and now I've set the stage and most people know all of that about you unless people have retired into San Angelo and don't know that. Talk to us a little bit about your childhood. When did you and your family know that you had such potential and gifts for the piano? Well, that started at a very young age. Actually, I was three years old when my mom first noticed any kind of musical talent. And she was a piano teacher. She used to teach uh, beginner students um, up to their second year, and then she would pass them on to another teacher. Uh, but she taught my older brother and sister as well piano. And to keep me out of trouble, she would hold me in her lap. And I was a very quiet child, and I would just kind of just, just sit there, and I wouldn't squirm or anything, but, but I would, she would just hold me there as she pointed out notes and, and you know, teaching the piece of music to my older brother and sister. And one day, I um, saw them to the bus stop, which was just in front of the house, and she was at the front door, and she made sure that they got on the bus, but then she heard music. And she thought one of the kids had sneaked back in because they hated going to school. And so <laughs> she, uh, she went back into the music room expecting to find one of them, you know, sitting there playing the piece she had just been teaching them, only to find me sitting at the piano where she'd left me, playing with all the right fingers the very piece that she had been trying to teach them. Oh, so. well, before this interview, I, uh, we discussed what a pivotal role your parents have played in your life and so from that point what on earth did your mother do? Well my mother said I think it's time for some lessons and so she was primarily my first teacher uh, until I was six years old and from then on she started she was always there to oversee me I had other teachers but she was there to oversee my practicing and she knew when I wasn't doing it right because of her studies and um, it just kind of grew from there. I mean, she was always just uh, resonating in the background as I practiced. And, uh, as for my dad, he wasn't musically trained, but he grew probably, now I would call, my best critic. Mm. And he finds pieces for me now, after so many years of hearing me practice classical pieces, when he hears something new, uh, he, and he knows immediately whether or not it's a good piece for me, and he'll bring it to me and tell me, learn this next. So, I mean, they both were such a support system growing up. You then took, as you said, uh, piano lessons from multiple teachers. What, did, what was your life like in high school? Uh, would it be normal, a normal high school life? Did you, you went to class, what else? Well, I, it was pretty normal. I, I was a very normal kid. I tried to stay out of trouble like most kids do. And um, I was involved in every possible Thing I could get into. I was in the orchestra. Lakeview had a newly formed orchestra as of my junior year and I had been playing violin already um, for quite a number of years and um, played in the band. I was an oboist in the band and uh, marched with saxophone because couldn't march with the oboe. 
Um, I was in jazz band playing piano, so I was involved in all the musical activities, but I also did uh, Future Homemakers of America, and uh, I loved my homemaking course, and uh, I had, uh, was on the tennis team for a couple of years, and that was fun, and I, even to this day, we'll still pick up the racket and play some friends. And, uh, and so I, I think I had a pretty normal childhood, but I guess what made it different for me is I loved music so much and, and always knew I wanted to do that. Always knew I wanted to make music as part of my life. So how much would you have practiced in a regular week in high school? Regular week in high school is kind of a misnomer because there is no regularity almost uh, other than classes you, you attend but some weeks the band was gone for a concert and this and that so it was hard. It was a hard struggle getting practice in and I remember um, I used to practice at churches sometimes. Uh, churches would let me practice on their grand pianos because I didn't have one at home. I had an upright which was great but when you're performing and competing so much you need to be working on the grand piano so I, my mom would pick me up from school and, and go and drop me off at a, at a church and I would practice three hours and then she'd pick me up in time for dinner and then I would go home and, and study and then practice violin and practice oboe and uh, study some more and then get a little bit more piano before I went to bed. So. Do you think you were spread too thin uh, with so many instruments? Absolutely not. I really that's a that's a that's a controversial thing because I was I played violin and piano and my violin teacher didn't want me to continue any more piano and my piano teacher didn't want mm -hmm. me to mm -hmm. do any more violin and uh, because they felt like if I would just concentrate on one uh, I would be uh, better well there's no doubt about that um, but that's like telling Michael Phelps to only concentrate on breast stroke. Good illustration! <laughs> so, even though it's all swimming, um, and, and for me it was all music. When I studied, when I started playing oboe, I didn't have to worry about how to, you know, about how to read the music. I could just play the instrument. I could focus on the technique of the instrument. Same thing with violin. I, I worked through the first two books of Suzuki violin very fast because I could read music. I mean, the music was not an obstacle to me. It was just learning the function of the instrument. but. At the same time, I, I strongly believe that if, if a student wants to do it, they'll find time to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the case with me, is I just always, I wanted to do it so much. And in fact, I even picked up trombone for, for a couple of months because I was interested in the instrument. Never played it successfully. You don't want to hear me play trombone. But, but I learned something about the instrument and I learned something, you know, all encompassing about music. And you know, those skills have really helped me in my own piano playing. You know, to understand how a, a violin feels uh, to play, to, how it vi the instrument itself will vibrate as you're playing a note, um, to be able to translate that into playing the piano, so that piano is not just a series of mechanisms, but you, you try to make the sound live and be alive. Well, how much, when you went to college, did you continue on with multiple instruments, or did you focus on one? In college is a little harder because mm -hmm. then you have your primary teacher. Uh, but by then, I really wanted to study piano more seriously, and, and piano was my entire focus. The other instruments were almost my extracurricular activities, and I knew that for myself mm -hmm. from when I first played with orchestra on piano uh, when I was 11 years old. I knew piano was always my instrument, and uh, so when I got to college, I played actually in the San Angelo Symphony still for a couple more years, and I would drive back for every concert and play in the orchestra concerts. I played oboe even a couple more years after that and uh, studied at University of North Texas with a great teacher, Charles Vesey, with oboe. And so those were all wonderful things, but as I did more competitions, mm -hmm. as I performed more, that in a way dictated my time. And so, so unfortunately I had to stop um, playing these instruments, stop having lessons, but, but even now I can pick them up and, and play them and still remember everything about them. Talk to us a little bit about the competitions. Reflect back on, uh, was there one or more than one that was a breakthrough for you? Or which ones or one uh, did you feel you're most proud that you won? Or did well? <laughs> Every one of them. <laughs> now, I've been in a lot of competitions and sometimes you play your absolute best and you don't get anything. And sometimes you, you feel like you just played awful and you win a prize or first. And, and probably one of the most memorable was when I was 11 and I won the San Angelo Young Musicians Competition. 
for the first time. I had been in it the year before. I was 10 years old. I was a very shy kid. And, um, and I just remember when I walked out on stage, I would just look at my feet the whole time. Um, and when I took the bow, I would look at my feet and come up. And I was still looking at my feet. <laughs> I would never look at the audience. But I, I played well. But I was very young inexperienced and I was so enthralled by the other performers who were my age uh, playing in this competition that I vowed the next year to come back sounding just as good as them and sure enough the next year I won and that was my first chance to play with the orchestra and so that was the start of it all I suppose and I never looked back after that when I was 11 one that was very memorable for me was when I was 17 and I competed in the Richardson Young Artist Competition uh, outside of Dallas and that's a pretty big one it, it attracts um, people from several states and very very talented pianists uh, very high level competition and I won that and so that was yeah, as you called a breakthrough that was definitely a breakthrough for me to, to realize that uh, that I could compete um, not just in the state of Texas but on a larger scope and uh, and so that really just along my entire career in life every time I got frustrated something like that would happen which would just propel me to the next stage, and, and it always kept my enthusiasm for, for what I was doing. Were you ever tempted to make this more your avocation instead of your vocation? Never. I mean, I, to me, music is, I, I'm so passionate about it. I'm passionate in every aspect from performing to the education of music, and I have been. I, I've been teaching since I was 15. And I, so, no, I, I just always knew that this would be the primary thing in my life and on some level. I mean, on, on many levels, I should say, um, because I have so many interests um, with music and with the piano. Well, you have seen, uh, as, as I have, sometimes dedicated artists are uh, temperamental and aren't necessarily the best teachers. But your temperament, from what I have observed of you, is uh, so uh, healthy and uh, d just delightful. Do you uh, believe that your temperament has led you to enjoy teaching? Absolutely. I think, uh, in fact, going back to linking it to learning multiple instruments, is, is I learned from so many different teachers here in San Angelo and I, I think just being able to work with this different personalities and seeing how they approached problem solving was a huge benefit to me uh, in my early stages and as you know my, my parents I, I owe it to them for, for the temperament that, as you call it that I have uh, they really gave me a very healthy approach very healthy approach to just uh, playing in general I remember one time after a competition I was, I was young, I was very young, but it was one of my more temperamental stages, uh, and I wasn't happy. And, and I was letting everybody know that. I was just sitting you know, on the couch after the performance and just with my head down, and people were coming up to me to tell me that they enjoyed my performance. And I just, just ignored them. Mm. And my mother was there to, uh, both my parents, but my mother was definitely there to say, look, this, this is not how you act. She said, when, some, when you perform, you thank everybody that, that comes and talks with you, she said, because you gave them something still. And even if you weren't happy, you're, she said, you're never going to be happy with it because that's the way we are as performers. You know, Performers are idealistic. So I think with the idea of turning that into being a little bit more pragmatic about how to approach teaching, I, I think that they just really gave me a healthy approach. And I love teaching, I love problem solving, but you're also working with a student and you're trying to inspire them. So. And some are more gifted and some are more moldable mm. than others. And uh, in my, when I, someone asked me the other day in an airport, uh, are you a teacher? And I said, I, yes, I am. I am a teacher. Absolutely. And I never got off into I was a superintendent because I, I enjoy the teaching and the we use the phrase overuse the light bulb coming on mm -hmm. but how can I keep coming at something until somebody grasps that yes and I have felt like your temperament was such that uh, you had the patience mm -hmm. and the interest to stay with someone until 
they grasp what you were trying to teach. Absolutely. So you're, <laughs> that is true, that is how you are? <laughs> yes, I'm very patient in lessons. Yes. <laughs> well, good. I don't want my bubble burst about you, Michael. <laughs> Well, what do you want to do when you finally finish this doctorate at this university that we, we both love That's a lot? Right. Is it when I grow up? Um, <laughs> everything. I mean, I, I see myself doing everything. I, I, performing is my first love, as you'll see in a minute. <laughs> performing is definitely my first love. It's silly to learn so much and not want to pass it on. And, and so, you know, I have a dedication to my art. And, and to me, music education is one of the undervalued things in America. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, so many people, including yourself, are doing so much to try to raise the level of awareness of how important it is to study music. And so I appreciated that about you very much. And, and, but there's so many people in, in the world working on this now and mm -hmm. finally trying to raise this. I mean, just as important as math and science. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it needs to be an innate sense in our, in our children and in our youth as, as they grow older. And so that's, that's one of my missions, actually. So I'm not really answering your question, what do I want to do? But, but my entire life, I think, is going to be dedicated to, to bringing music to as many people as possible and educating them just in this fantastic art. There, I mean, there's, there's kind of an inner spirituality of music that, that people can take for granted or not pay attention to, I should say. And, and those that somehow don't pay attention to it, or, or I think are lacking a whole aspect of life. And um, it, it really is reverent. It really is a very peaceful thing to find that uh, in the performance. And so that's what I try to bring when I perform and when I teach even. Um, so do you see yourself while you're performing also maybe teaching on the college level or privately? Uh, both, actually. Okay. I, I see myself in uh, definitely at a university. Uh, the doctorate degree that I'm working on now will allow me to be able to teach at a university level, uh, and which is a wonderful thing for me because I love working with all ages. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, every teacher I know enjoys teaching uh, smaller children as well, and that's that's where you have the most influence, actually. Without a doubt. And, and the you know the interesting thing in China and Russia, the very best teachers teach the youngest. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think you see that, especially with the Olympics going on now and the gymnastics, you know, the very best teachers are teaching from the youngest ages. Um, and, and I think that's, a, that's an important precedent to also bring to America and to find. And so I, I, I find myself to be a pretty good teacher. I think that I am. And, uh, and I'm going to keep improving upon that. But I, I definitely want to be able to teach some, some children as well, uh, because I think that that's an important thing to, to teach across the board. Um, so. Well, this community, uh, I've rarely s witnessed a community like San Angelo who has uh, absolutely is in love with who you are as well as your generosity in sharing uh, your talent and your gifts. And I would love now for you to play whatever you would like to. And I remember a few months ago, um, a conversation uh, with you about what were your fav who were your favorite composers mm -hmm. if you could just choose and play uh, a handful of composers and do you, do you remember what you said tell me who your favorite some of your favorite composers well my repertoire centers around the romantic period that's what you so told me that it, it falls there a majority of it falls there I mean I love Chopin Liszt Rachmaninoff uh, some lesser knowns, Paderewski and Gottschalk, and, uh, and these are happen to be some of uh, the pieces that I, I guess I connect with mostly. But I, I love all music, and my my real answer to that would have to be what my favorite piece of music is what I whatever I happen to be playing at the time. Well, one <laughs> thing I've noticed about you, but I'm let's see how close I am. <laughs> You have gr you have strength, so you can play works that require strength. Mm -hmm. But you have your fine motor skills. Are you're blessed to also do a beautiful job with flowing mm. pieces that require a great diversity in volume. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've 
So I'm not sure what I think uh, of all the pieces I've heard you play are my favorites yet. But <laughs> now play some for us and uh, take our souls to a higher level, Michael. This is a transcription of a song by Robert Schumann, who wrote this song called Dedication. It's a love song for his then fiance on their wedding night, Clara Schumann, who was considered one of the greatest pianists of the 19th century, Robert Schumann being one of the greatest composers of the 19th century. But this was transcribed for piano solo, integrating the voice part into the piano part and made a little bit more dazzling by Franz Liszt. This is a composition that I wrote when I was 15 years old, still at Lakeview High School, and it's called Prelude Number no. 3, but I subtitled it Peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, and I think it's very appropriate in today's world that we have a lot of peace. <laughs> 